Hey, everyone. <laughs> <coughs> My name is Brady. And I'm, I'm Chuck Parson. And this is the life after. This is the last episode of the season. This is the final episode of season ba, ba, one, which I don't even, da, we didn't decide until halfway through the season that we were going to do seasons. Done. I honestly, I, I saw that uh, the, the airing of grief is doing it. I'm like, oh, we have to. <laughs> It's like, we got to keep up with the Joneses. Shout out Derek Webb. Shout out Jamie Finch. So uh, we're going to have a a little bit of fun with the show. Um, We're going to uh, engage with some some listeners, some of our our fans, and some of the people from our discussion page. Um, And I want to start out the show with a little bit, uh, a little bit of a lighthearted kind of, uh, kind of intro segment. Hmm. Yeah. Brady, <laughs> we're loosening up, aren't we, Chuck? Okay. We're loosening up a little right. bit. Yeah, I know. I'm always me, the serious one. Let me unbutton the shirt here. Like I can be, uh, uh, I can be fun too, Brady. Yeah, you're not the only fun one. Yeah, and I, I could be smart. <laughs> Oh, yes, the proximity of the super lab Syrian is all blah. Hey, but if good. we take it back to the original Greek, then we'll find out that it was actually mysticism the whole time. <laughs> That was really good, Brady. Thanks. I think we're I think we're good on the last episode. That was pretty solid yep. content right there. That was good. Uh Brady, I had a question for you. Yes, Chuck. Um uh you watch a lot of TV. Yes, I'm a very lonely you, individual. You <laughs> <laughs> Next question. You You watch uh, Brady probably watches he probably watches more TV than than most people that I know. And I don't mm. mean that in like a bad way. It's a hobby. Like he he, he really you really I'm engage really into television, yes. You really engage with the culture and the the nuance and you are you're a television critic. You just don't get paid for it, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But you probably should. Let's be realistic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We, we said it. People come to me and they say, hey, Brady, what show should I be watching right now? Exactly. So I wanted to ask you, uh, in light of, our, of, the, of the nature of our show, mm-hmm. what television shows have assisted you in your deconstruction oh, or in your shit. reconstruction? I love this question. Um, off the top of my head, a big one for me was Transparent. There's a scene in Transparent in the first episode that finally right understood people who are trans okay and i was like i get it and uh that's kind of like been a ongoing thing of helping me kind of like come into my sexuality uh boo jeffrey tamer i love trans transparent um another one honestly kimmy schmidt the unbreakable kimmy schmidt the unbreakable kimmy schmidt um i was a huge 30 rock fan liz lemon like she's on right wall. so tina fey original series or, or tina fey's creation yes big deal for me and i heard about it way before it even like a year before it came out and so i was okay. reading up on it you were like anticipating i was anticipating and so i was like oh my god this show and so when i'm watching it i, I do find it kind of relatable in some ways even though it's just batshit crazy funny well uh, yeah i mean like the cult aspect of it is very you know it's just a hyperbolic version of fundamentalism Mm -hmm. really you know crazy crazy pastor things that don't make sense a lot of weird purity culture stuff um and kimmy comes into the world after having been abducted as a 14 year old basically not having any idea how anything works basically me (laughs) brady harden basically the unbreakable brady harden yeah, so that was a, that was a big one for me. And and remember, there's even been episodes where I'm like trying to like give this really heartfelt speech and like analogy. I'm like, and you know, like it's in it's in my episode. I'm like crying, where I'm like, you know, in Kimmy Schmidt, where she's just cranking the wheel, and you know, right, like trying to right, talk about right. her childhood, oh, yeah. and I'm like about to cry. Yeah, it's just I don't know. Like I'm not super emotional to that show, but I, I love it. Um, another big one for me is um, Crashing on HBO yes. with Pete Holmes because, right. you know, Pete Holmes plays this nerdy uh, fundamentalist guy who's coming out of fundamentalism after his wife, Jesse, cheated on him, Right, which is basically me. Like, I was a nerdy fundamentalist kid until my wife cheated. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I didn't know anything. And so he's trying to figure out the world as an adult, and I'm trying to figure out the world as an adult. And I uh, really relate with that. Cool. Um, and those are the main ones. Those are the main ones. Those are the big ones. Yeah. If So now we have a official, an official The Life After watch list. Ooh, yeah. 
Yeah. What about you? What kind of? You're more of a music person. Yes. As, like the SATs would say, as Brady is to television, Chuck is to music. Yeah. Yes. That's what. <laughs> that's what the SATs say. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I can see it. you. You can be smart. Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> Glad Love I got you, my smart card from the um, president of the smart club. So I, uh, yeah, I, I kind of got to, I got to dig a little bit to think about this because the bulk of my deconstruction was a while ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the first things I thought of was um, uh, there's a, there's an album by Josh Ritter called So Runs the World Away. Um, and he, I, I don't really, I don't know his background. I don't know how he grew up. Um but it seems like he has a Christian background of some sort. Um, and there are a few songs on that record where he sort of expresses his frustration with uh, Christian culture. Uh, one of the lines that really stuck out to me that I think I probably posted to Facebook a couple of times while I was thinking through things. You yeah. know? Uh, he says, uh, for, every, for every cry in the night, somebody says, have faith. Be content inside your questions, Minotaurs inside a maze. Tell me oh. what's the point in light you have to strike a match to find. And I oh thought that was God. fucking great because it's like we because I found myself uh, like tr- like uh, tr- like going out of my way to make Christianity fit my life. Whereas he's saying, what's the point in what's the point in light you have to strike a match to find? Like, why do you have to put in all the effort? To, to see the mm. light why why doesn't the light just why isn't it just self-evident right so that was kind of i wrestled with that line a lot that was a, that was a big thought if for me. anybody ever wants to seduce me take me out for pasta <laughs> get up in my ear and whisper those lyrics in my ear there you, there you go and now I, you have it guys uh anybody that is uh trying to ride the brady train yeah that's like my equivalent of like rebecca getting the horse some water and the guy's like <laughs> Ah, uh, the Lord has let me know. That's my sign right there. <laughs> right, right. <sighs> Beautiful. Uh, who else? Um, interestingly enough, um, uh, Andy Hull and Manchester Orchestra, Andy Hull's work in general, um, and I actually think he might still identify as like a really liberal Christian. I'm not totally sure if he's out or not. It's mm-hmm. not really clear. Um, but a lot of his lyrics uh, in Manchester Orchestra and his project... Um, uh, a right away great captain um are both just really wrestling with the some of the the drudgier like more difficult aspects of christianity or of of having faith in general there's a so they, he has an album called simple math and there's the title track is called simple math um and part of the chorus is um um it it's it's a little bit abstract but in the context of the song it makes more sense but it's uh what if what if it were true and all we thought was right was wrong. Simple math, the truth cannot be fractioned. Um, mm. So it's it's sort of this like, uh, uh, this like idea that it, it either all has to fit like a, like a big puzzle piece and it has to go together like religion or, or, or this faith. All the pieces have to fit or it's just the truth can, can't be fractioned. So it's either all or nothing, right? Um, and at the time I was sort of wrestling with this, this theme that I, I think I bring up a lot on the show, which is how much of the Bible can you not believe before it all crashes before down. you mm-hmm. just admit that you don't believe any of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was sort of what I was wrestling with at the time was so simple math. The truth can't be fractioned. It's an interesting bit mm-hmm. for me. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so another one that comes to mind, uh, is so I started getting I started getting really into hip hop like as I was transitioning to I, I used to be like a, a rock and roll purist or like a like a, you had to play an instrument to be a musician kind of person you know um, mm. but I've I've since long since abandoned that uh, and and like deeply deeply into hip hop now um, and one of the first hip hop big hip hop records that I got into. Um, well, I, I could I shouldn't say one of the first, um, but one one record that really influenced me was um, it, it's Kanye West and Jay Z did a record called Watch the Throne uh, together. It's super popular, um, and the first track on it is called No Church in the Wild, and on the on the chorus, um, Frank Ocean sings uh, sings the chorus, and he says, "Human beings in a mob. What's a mob to a king? What's a king to a god? What's a god to a non-believer who don't believe in anything?" And 
I guess like uh, there's a lot of that in hip hop. There's a there's a line by Killer Mike, uh, "Run the Jewels" line where he says, uh, "I don't need a preacher preaching on my behalf. No teachers can't teach my arrogant ass." Like so, it's a lot of that is just empowering, like the human intellect. Yeah. You know, the ability to like. Human beings in a mob. What's a mob to a king? So, and it's it's kind of the same thing. It's like, what's a god to a non-believer? Like, overthrow the god. You know, I, I, if you don't believe, then it doesn't have any power or influence over you. It's like rock paper scissors, except right one just wins. Except there's an end to it, right? Yeah, hmm. the the human intellect. So, uh, so music that empowered me to 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 not be afraid to think for myself, which I think is probably if I if I had to write. The five core tenets of hip hop. One of them is think for yourself. There we you go. know, like yeah. don't be don't be shy about what you what you think. Mm-hmm. You know, say it right. So, um, yeah, those are that's my that's the the start of the official uh, life after playlist. Well, no, we actually have an official playlist, don't we? We do. We do. <laughs> I, I need to add. I need to add that. I need to add those tracks to it. And another thing to add on there would be documentaries. Cause there's a few documentaries that really stood out to me. They weren't like TV shows, but uh-huh. Holy hell was a big one. Yeah. Um, just documentaries about cults mm-hmm. and seeing how they operate, how they answer things. And then I just saw so many different patterns like, oh, that's how I would have answered at that time about my religion if I was in that situation. And then that kind of like helped me piece things together as well. Like, yeah. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Hey, there's there. I, I love that in the same way that religion impacts every aspect of your life. You can also uh, like there are things in every aspect of your life that can assist you in your in your deconstruction and in your your new path after religion, right? Like in the same way that religion affects everything, deconstruction can be, can be sort of helped by everything. So TV, music, you know, like really simple stuff that we engage in in any way can be, we can, we can, we can grow and improve and and heal through that different media, you know? Joey, welcome to the show. We're bringing you one. Uh, this is, as you know, the last episode of season one, and I wanted to do a feature on one of our fans that we've met because of the show, and I chose you. Welcome. Oh, that's so nice. Definitely. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> welcome. Uh, Joey, you started off as a Christian. Were you born into a fundamentalist home? What was your upbringing like? You know, um, I wasn't really born into a fundamentalist home. That was my fa- my parents were pretty nominal Christians, so we we spent a lot of time in like um, a Southern Baptist church. Um, uh, once once we moved to the states, um, uh, I lived I lived abroad for a while when I was a kid in places like Canada and Ireland. Um, uh, my parents worked for the government, and so we moved around a lot and. Um, so when we got to the States, uh, it was like they were looking for a church because they were Christians, but it wasn't like uh, there was like a hardcore thing. But that church uh, quickly fell out of favor uh, because like a lot of Southern Baptist churches, you know, it was focused mainly on the pastor. And so well, we went looking around um, and we came across a, a small fundamentalist Baptist church um, that was seemed to be growing pretty steadily just up, up the road from the previous church we were going to. Um, that's a very American thing. You don't this typically seems find convenient, right? Yeah, it's typically, it's typically you don't find that in Europe or Canada. It's uh, they're pretty spread apart, um, especially Protestant churches. But um, so we started attending, and I was around fourteen. So I, I was having a lot of questions about faith. I was having a lot of. Uh, watching a lot of documentaries and historical documentaries because that was um, that was just how I was. I was a nerd, and uh, of course the historical Jesus came up a lot, so I had a lot of questions. And uh, this pastor seemed to have answers. You know, he was very well educated. He um, had a doctorate in Greek and Hebrew. He had two PhDs. He wow. seemed to know what he was talking. About. 
And so, um, so it quickly became evident that I was interested in a lot of things that pastors were interested in and uh, people in ministry. And so in a tiny church, I got a lot of attention and they kind of welcomed me in with open arms, answered all of my questions that I had. Uh, looking back on it now, I can see that they're kind of twisting themselves in pretzels to explain uh, certain facts uh, that they didn't exactly know. They just believed, you know. <laughs> right. But um, at the same time, I didn't know that because I was a kid and uh, started to come up in the youth group, started to um, be put in leadership. And uh, like all things insidious, which I believe that fundamentalist uh, ideology is, especially for young people, um, you're taken in. Uh, I was rejected a lot at school. I was I was taken in very much. So I was told how to dress. I was told how to wear my hair. I was told where to go, who to hang out with, um, where to go to school uh, for my college years. So uh, everything was laid out for me, and I'm lazy. So, uh, so you just that went was, with it, right? Uh, yeah, I just went with it. You know, it's like, oh, these guys know what they're talking about, so they, they want what's best for me. I found a good group of people, you know. But in hindsight, and, you kind of feel like they, like, that was a, that was a sort of a pivotal period <clears throat> in, your, in your development, in your figuring out what your adulthood would be like. And yeah, very much so. And that, yeah. all of that sort of, like, control and steering and, and pointing you in, in X direction was like actually really detrimental to your your future, right? Yeah, so much so much so that um, yeah, I, I developed a really good, healthy anti-authoritarian streak in me after I was eighteen. You know, uh -huh. um, but at the same time, I didn't know that I could leave whenever I wanted to. You know, um, if you didn't show up to church for two weeks, uh, suddenly somebody was on your doorstep. Um, there to counsel you or see right. how you were doing, what mm. you've been up to. We've missed you this uh, last few we've weeks. We've missed you, right. what you, you know, and, and things like that. It's like, I don't know, uh, you know, I've been busy, I, I have a job, um, things like that. And then after college, after Bible college, um, it became even more serious. Well, we, you know, you need to be more serious. You need to be more grounded. You need to be more disciplined if you want to be a pastor. Uh, we want to dang you and we want to put you through seminary, but you got to you got to do this stuff. You got to be willing to go out uh, canvassing with uh, with this guy here who mm. you don't know, but you you need to be you know, you need to be shepherded in by him. So also during this time period, you have to understand between the ages of 14 to 22, the church grew from. 150 people to 1200 people oh wow okay. so it, it it was it was it blew up so the attention that i was getting uh the stewardship i was getting always being kind of pushed off onto guys who i just really didn't like um and didn't have didn't like me very much either but because they were going with the flow too they wanted to be patted on the head just like everybody else um it, it, it they they went along with it and so it, it led to some really tense conversations some really uh tough times in my life uh feeling like i didn't belong feeling like um there was something wrong with me i was told at one point why do you talk the way you do you just need to you know develop an american accent or something like that oh, to fit in more interesting. um uh, why do you read the books that you read? Because I was reading people like Kafka or Christopher Hitchens, even as a Christian, because I wanted to know what they thought. I think that's that's a valid way of educating yourself. And um, um, I was told that that was going to lead me astray and mm. didn't know that that they were wrong. It's like, well, they're smarter than me. They're older than me. Um, you know, so... I, I went through all of that through a period of being educated in the fundamentalist system at home, going to a fundamentalist ba a Baptist Bible college for four years, which was in West Virginia and had a total of 300 people. Let me tell you, that was a fun time. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, dude. Um, so <laughs> they, you couldn't watch movies. You couldn't listen to music. I, I went along with that for about six months, and I got into a trouble a lot there. But um, I graduated, you know, with a – very healthy 2.1 GPA because I stopped going to classes after a while, Ooh, but I yeah. could still pass. I could still pass the test, you know, because uh -huh. yeah. I I read all the books. <laughs> so um, I, but I didn't do very many projects. I was deeply depressed, but I didn't know what depression was because mm. no one had ever told me what it was. Um, just trying to figure out uh, 
what I was going to do with my life. Like I watched the movie Gross Point Blank every day. I watched the movie The Matrix every day my junior year. You know, just because it, it was just a way to kill four hours. I didn't know what else to do. Wow. Um, yeah. So, so came, coming out of that, I needed a way to pay for seminary. I joined the army um, because 9/11 had happened, and I was uh, Captain America for Jesus, or so I thought. And um, mm. promptly uh, got hurt in training, um, and spent uh, some time laid up, and uh, was able to get back into training as a medic. Um, I originally went in as infantry, and it was at this time I was stationed. I was an army guy, an army medic with a with a marine platoon, and I was sitting on top of a mountain uh, as we were on patrol, probably about day 15 into 30 for me. Um, just thinking, you know, if I die here, no one's going to give a shit. <laughs> like mm. no one, no one in my, no one in my church is going to care. They're going to be sad, but nobody really, nobody really likes me. Um, mm. it, it, no politician's going to give a shit. Um, and so that was kind of the beginning of the end. Um, when I came home, I got hurt. Uh, I came, I went back to the States after a very short rotation. I was very lucky. Um, came back, um, went through fast rope school up in Kentucky, uh, got hurt again, and the Army said, thanks, but no thanks. So that career was done. Um, come back home, and I remember the day I came home, I, I, my pastor was out in the parking lot, and I was there too. I said, hey, I'm back. He goes, oh, hey. Hmm. I had been gone for like a year. It yeah. just didn't mean anything to yeah. me for some reason. Didn't mean didn't mean anything. Yeah. Um, so... Uh. So cut to all of that, and we'll probably talk a bit more about this later, but I found it very difficult with a uh, 2.0 GPA from a Bible college and a degree in what I now say theology, but it really just says Bible. <laughs> right. It says Bible theology on it. So it's essentially worthless. Um, I spent a lot of time I spent a lot of time in retail jobs. I spent a lot of time um, just hopping from job to job to job, just trying to scrape through a living. You know, let me uh, and, let me rewind just a little bit. So, at what point did you decide, uh, like, I don't want to, I don't want to or care to go into ministry? Was it? I mean, was it when you were dealing with the depression in Bible college, or because that seems like kind of a pivotal, like you were on this trajectory and then you just sort of dropped it, right? I didn't. I didn't make that decision until about two thousand eight. Believe it okay. or not, um, I, I struggled for. I graduated from Bible college in two thousand and one, um, and. Really, I I went to seminary for two years. I got 66 hours into a Master's of Divinity degree. Um, I'm dyslexic. Um, and so when I hit the last stage, which I had been putting off, which was Hebrew, um, I, I couldn't do it. Um, mm, okay. I, I could muddle my way through the Greek. Uh, I used a lot of, I would get C's, you know. Uh, I, but I could, I could probably still read a manuscript a day. At least I, I, I know I can look at it and I can, I can pick my way through it. Sure. But I use a lot of online tools and stuff. But Hebrew I could not, mm -hmm. um, mainly because I, I see a mirror image and I have to train myself. But it's completely unfamiliar, and I'm having to read, uh, you know, right to left. And mm -hmm. I was banging my head against the wall. At this point, I was married. I had had, I had two boys. Um, the first one was displaying signs of autism. Mm -hmm. uh, at that point, right. my marriage was falling apart because I was working two full-time jobs. Oh my god! Uh, one in one in the morning to clean, and one at night. Um, and I was just starting to beat my head against the wall. Yeah. So finally, at that point, um, I always had in my head, I can't quit because if I quit, people are going to think I'm not serious, or people are going to think I'm a failure. Mm. And then when I finally right. dropped, I dropped all of those balls I was juggling. Um, it, uh, it finally just, uh, I finally just went, Oh, this, this feels nice. <laughs> this feels really good. Um, and at that point I was like, okay, so I've dropped this ministry thing. I no longer have to worry about anybody in the church. I no longer worry about all of this bullshit that I was doing to put on air so that they would give me a thumbs up every once in a while and say I was okay. Uh, what do I do? what the fuck do I do now so I can eat so my kids yeah. can eat yeah yeah mm. and uh, and that's a really you know. I mean that's like a super common that's something that you wrestle with Brady that's anybody that's been through Bible college or through seminary that has to make a fucking living is gonna have this really <laughs> difficult predicament of like well 
I'm starting from scratch, right? I mean, I thought of it recently. There's, uh, I, I forgot what conversation it was or what I was listening to. Maybe it was uh, Jonathan Vanessa's uh, podcast, the guy from Queer Eye. But they're they talking about queer kids who are coming out. And it's hard because after they come out, a lot of times they, they don't have anything to do. Like they have nowhere to go. Their family throws them out or yeah. whatever. And it's really common with fundamentalism. And so I've been thinking about, you know, now as somebody who's not religious, who's secular, who doesn't believe anymore, I'm an ex fundy. How do I feel about encouraging people to come out as an ex fundy? Because for a lot of us, it, it's going to mean a lot of shit you know mm. and and for well, a lot me, of us a lot of us are employed by people that go to our churches because that's our right, social group right right and and that's the that was the thing that i'm in and i realized i don't talk about it that much on the show but literally i my entire life was going to be a pastor since i was 14 years old i committed myself to the ministry there was yep. no second thought there was no backup plan i knew um that i was going to do that and i was trusting the lord uh, my family wasn't going to help pay for college or anything so i had to figure out my own plan and i trusted everything that that was going to happen and when it fell through um my career as a christian it did not i did not think that it was over when I came out as gay, it mm. happened before that. I knew that it was happening when my, when I knew that um, my ex-wife was going to divorce me. Yeah. Because I knew that um, within my denomination, as a Southern Baptist, I would never be respected or trusted as a divorced man. Um, even if I could say, oh, well, she, you know, she instigated or she cheated, it's her. I would still be untrusted because yeah. they would always be like, well, did you do this enough or did you do that enough? Mm -hmm. You know, everything like that. It would somehow come back to me or the verse. It's like, you know, if you're in the ministry um, and you don't have a family who's believing, then it disqualifies you to be an elder. There would always be something that and it was when, there's always a disqualifying thing. Yeah. When she know. filed for divorce, that's when I knew I could, I can't ever make a living out of this religion. And I started to question if that is the case, if my own people would not trust me enough to lead them because of what happened to me, I don't know if I want to be a part of that. And that's when things started to kind of, you know, getting yeah. ready to start deteriorating for me. Yeah. So, Joey, how did, I mean, uh, what was your journey at that point like uh, professionally? What, how did you, how did you get to where you are now and, and how did you overcome that? that uh that period of your life well i i, I got I, whenever i describe jobs that i've had in the past people go have you worked everywhere and i'm like yeah pretty much you <laughs> yeah. know um yeah. i i would work two two or three jobs at a time and i had did done that since i was like 16 you know um just because i like working i like making money i also like spending it but i like making it too mm -hmm. um but uh, at that point, let's just say around 2008, 2009, I, I decided, well, my son had been diagnosed, my oldest son had been diagnosed with autism. Um, my youngest son um, was not speaking. He was about two years old. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we realized this, this looks like he's going to have this as well. So mm -hmm. I, um, I got a job as a financial planner thinking... You know, this is uh, financial planning, by, by the way, it's just glorified salesmanship. You're just begging friends and family to place their retirement funds with, with the company you're right, working for. Right, right, right. Um, Facebook friends are so well, I know. Right. And they'll, and they'll just, you know, they'll manage that. You know, the boss, my boss will manage it for you. I'm not managing it. So you can trust this guy here, you know, just bring him in. And it's, it's a, uh, I, and at the time, you think you're going to make a ton of money, but that's not the case. But... I was finding clients. I was going out networking. I was talking with uh, pediatricians and speech therapists because that's who I was speaking with on a daily basis um, because of my children. And mm. I, I, at the time, uh, around 2010, the iPad had been out for uh, a year. And I, I was thinking, well, my sons could probably have an app that will, mm. that will help them speak. And the only one I could find was $300 on the app store, which, you know, for apps, I was like, whoa, that's crazy, you know. Yeah. And so I went to the speech therapist going, hey, do you know any 
any apps for kids uh you know and he, and he said oh the ipad's a toy man nobody's doing that and i was uh -huh. like what <laughs> yeah and um i had always liked tech i had always i always followed it i'd always messed around with it but i never um never really thought that i could do anything with it and at that point i just said well there's nothing out there what's stopping somebody from making an app like this right, you know so right. to help their kids so I um, started to formulate an idea of being able to take pictures of whatever I wanted to to help my son communicate. So you could take pictures and then you could record, record your voice into that picture. So whenever my son would touch it, he would hear my voice coming out of the iPad. Hmm. And I grabbed an Objective-C book and I started to learn how to code for the iPad. Um, and it sucked, it sucked really bad. It got rejected three times from yeah. the App Store. Okay, yeah. Um, so I... I went and I would talk to anybody who had listened about helping me develop this thing. And eventually I came across a group of uh, guys uh, who were willing to help me get it done. And so um, we got it finished. We got it put onto the app store and mm. all of a sudden I was an app developer. Yeah. Um, more of a product manager, but you know, I still came up with the idea. I hustled and made it happen. Yeah. And to make ends meet, I was, um, scrubbing floors at night at a hotel and fetching towels. And in the daytime, I was cleaning warehouses and scrubbing floors at FedEx warehouses and stuff. When the trucks were out, they needed to clean the floors, so I would do that. Um, and I that that got me some publicity. I was in TechCrunch. I was in Inc.com. I was in a few other things. Um, but the app failed pretty horribly <laughs> because people don't want to pay twenty dollars for an app. They want to pay nothing for an app. So right. it was a race to the bottom. It didn't make any money. And I was thinking, well, I tried that, but that was a failure. But because of research, because of tenacity, because I love technology, I just kept at it. And yes. eventually, uh, after about three years of being broke and losing an apartment and having a marriage that failed because of the app um, and because of kids with autism, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I just basically decided to learn how to code. I just said, that's it. I, my friends who were coders, and I got a lot of friends who were coders because of my app, uh, they really appreciate what I was doing. Um, and I had a weird story of having just a theology degree and having left this church that I was a part of um, and this life and trying to start fresh, um, it, 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 I had to undergo education all over again. I had to go through, um, I had to go through math again. I had to go through language. I had to go struggle with dyslexia and struggle with the idea of, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm an idiot. I'm too old. Um, I don't know enough. Um, sure, yeah. You know, all of these things. Uh, and I had a real uh, inferiority complex for a long time, you know. Um, even though I, I read a lot and I, and I did a lot of things, it just, um, it, it, it was really, it was really a tough process to have to get over and let go of a past where uh, people were abusing me, steering me in the wrong direction, um, kept me from uh, fully realizing potential. But I kind of took that back, you know, and it took me a good, four years of learning but on my fourth year i got a gig so i took a chance on me and now i work at a uh, a credit union as a developer for databases and for uh small apps uh, i'm still learning every day i i suck at it you know i'm never going to be the world's best developer i'm really not but um but the good thing is is I, I learned a lot through it i learned a lot about the humanities i learned a lot about engineering and um what a lot of people are learning when they're 18, 19, 20 years old in college, I'm learning at the age of 38, 39. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's grind. And, yeah. and you know, the, and I, I think it's a big grind mainly because also um, my degree isn't in, isn't in computer science. Um, so my initial first job Nobody wanted to take a chance on me because they're like, well, this guy didn't go. This guy went to college like almost 20 years ago and he got a degree in theology. You know, I, I don't think I can use him because he doesn't know the processes that I need him to know. It's not being mean. It's just it's just a simple fact of it. But uh, the more I, I uh, put in the work and went to a coffee shop every night and just refused to stop taking tutorials and building stupid little tiny apps, 
uh, eventually somebody's like, oh, well, this guy seems to know what he's doing. <laughs> and uh, I was able to bluff my way into a job. But um, cool. And now I have a career. You know, I have a career that I can work for the next 20 years and, yeah. and hopefully uh, save up some money and not have to work retail ever again, which right. is nice. <laughs> oh, my Yay. God. I love that story <laughs> so much. Um, I relate so much with what you're talking about with, like, loneliness has always been a reoccurring theme in my life. And feelings yeah. of infer- inferiority, like, that is a huge thing for me. I remember seeing the movie It's a Wonderful Life and feeling like that character. Uh, what is his yeah. name? George Bailey? Yep. Anyway, where he was, you know, stuck in the hometown and everybody else went off to college jail, went off and did their own thing. I always trusted, you know, God's going to bring me through. I'm going to get the right job. You know, like I know I'm going to go into the ministry and I'm going to be successful because he's going to want that for me. And I just was relying my entire future on that. And when that didn't play out and now that I'm, you know, have my Bible degree, which is a huge area of shame for me, um, my... Bible degrees from an unaccredited Bible college online. Um, it like I worked my ass off for the degree. I read, I wrote right. thirty page papers yeah. like every two or three week. It was insane. Um, but I'm so ashamed of that now because I'm like I'm an atheist with a Bible degree. You know, like it was like fourteen <laughs> of my years. It was like an unsaved Word document where I've been writing down for. 14 years and then all of a sudden I accidentally closed it without saving and that's what mm. that's where I'm at mm. now you mm-hmm. know and you know I wake <laughs> up at 28 I'm you know 32 now and still like trying to figure it out and I I have a marketing job right now that I'm making up as I go along but I'm actually kind of kicking ass at um it's working out but I I I don't think we talk enough about how difficult the journey this of, is a really common problem yeah i don't think we talk about it that often yeah we don't and we feel we feel alone in it you know i mean we really do and like we're the only ones right because mm-hmm. it's uh, so you say that all the time uh, somebody literally made a post about this on our on our discussion page today like this morning whoa about this exact you know like finding a job after going into ministry i think that isolation is a big thing with me too mm. and um because Anyone that I started to date who uh, has no clue as to, you know, what a Bible college is or or um, my upbringing or um, no clue as to what a fundamentalist church is like. They're like, why would you stay in that? You know, that's the common question. And <laughs> it's like, well, you know, here's the funny thing about abuse. Um, <laughs> right, right. You, you think that there's something wrong with you not the other way around. And um, you want to change yourself. Um, And it's not until you break out of that for a while where people are like genuinely nice to you and like, hey, that's really great what you did with that app thing. And I'm like, no, it's, you know, I failed at it or something like that. They're like, no, it's it's really fucking great. Take the compliment, dick. You gotta gotta put yourself down. Right, right. (laughs) Yeah, you gotta put yourself down because you're waiting for uh, that, that big foot from this... It's just the Lord. It's just the Lord working yeah. through me. Yeah, the Lord did it. You know, it's just like, <laughs> and that's not. It, sometimes it's fake humility. You can tell fake humility, but for me, I really believe it. Like, no, I'm a piece of shit. I didn't do that. God did it because there's no way I could do it because I'm a piece of shit. You know, it's a circular right. reasoning of uh, terribleness. Um, but once I started to get out of that, you know, I, I, I live here in Norfolk, Virginia, and so it's the largest naval base in the world. Um, I started to meet a lot of ex-military guys. Who were coming out and the only job they've ever had since they were 18 was you know working working on a missile silo on a submarine or working at you know working on computers or something like that but they can't get a gig because nobody recognizes military training as formal training so you know i i had stumbled across in my time this thing called free code camp uh when i was learning to code and mm. it's a it's free it's in the name, but it's better. It's if it's equal to, if not better than, a lot of uh, paid what they call coding boot camps. Coding boot camps are fairly intensive things where you go for three months, you live in another town, and they teach you how to code, the basics of how to program. And at the end, you go through a battery of interviews with companies that align with the boot camps to because they're looking for programmers, obviously. Uh, but Free Code Camp has you do it on your own time, and it's free because those. 
those uh, intensive boot camps cost about fifteen to if not thirty thousand dollars sometimes, you know. Um, and so I started a local meetup just for people like me, you know, people who had no technical background, knew that they wanted to make a better living, wanted to grind and um, and put the work in. And you get a lot of ex-military, you get a lot of college students who have computer science degrees. Turns out they don't really teach you to code all that much in a computer science uh, degree. They teach you a lot of theory, but not mm-hmm. a lot of coding okay. and practical uh, applications. So uh, enough to get a gig as a coder. So um, so uh, all the questions I had to Google on my own and question and wrestle with and talk to other coding friends of mine about, uh, I can now provide all that answers where they're asking me questions or hung up on things where they're scared of like, what, what language should I learn uh, at first? Or, you know, what, how much of that should I know? Or should I really do this? Cause I'm hearing a lot about machine learning. Should I know that? And I could just, you know, I can just bat away the shit they don't need to worry about and just be like, look, here's what you need to focus on here, here, and here. Hmm. And uh, allows me to be a mentor and, um, when I started to see a lot of people have the same problems I did, it was really when I started to realize, oh, I'm not unique. Um, I'm not alone in this. Uh, I had to do a lot of work. And so I expect others to do a lot of work too. But hmm. other than that, um, it's, it allows me to be kind. And um, I, I saw this thing about a Christian coding boot camp so they can be in ministry and just code for churches. And I'm like, you never want to get paid? Are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. You know, why mm-hmm. would you want to go and program exclusively for churches? Well, it's because that's the Christian bubble, right? right. You can't you have this castle of, and they look over the edge every once in a while and they're like, I don't like that. And they go back down. Like, I'll be safe if I code for Christians only. When in fact, they're more likely to get fucked over by uh, Christians <laughs> or a church uh, then and, and not get paid and expect to just be okay with it because you know the Lord will take care of it. It's a different um, economy for sure. Exactly. Yeah. You know. So uh, anyway, uh, all of that to be said, it, it the the terrible experience of having to go through five years of scrubbing floors at night and questioning, you know, was I even worth living? Um, and now I'm at the point now where I can help others, and that makes without. Without the aspect of I'm doing this as a ministry, I don't have to do that. I'm just want to help people out because I went through it too. So that's a it's a it's a good um, just it's a good process. FC, FC. Yeah, that's huge. Joey, I want to thank you so much for joining us today for our last episode of this season. Uh, congratulations on being our last like interview like this for the season. <laughs> right. Well, it's my pleasure, guys. And let me just say. Um, it has been such a joy the last six months to be a part of the life after, be a part of the page, meeting people, talking to you guys, meeting you guys online, listening to you talk to other people who um, struggle. It, I cannot, I cannot emphasize enough how much um, it's. I was kind of wandering in the wilderness here, and I just kind of uh, felt that way. And I know that's a common refrain on the page, but. It's it's very true. Uh, you you mm-hmm. don't. It's tough to find people who not only are Christians but people who have left Christianity as right. well. And all mm-hmm. of the all of the things that I'd say that my faith is static. I mean, not static at the moment. I wane between going. There's nothing after this. To no, he's probably there. I just don't get him, and I want to explore this more. You sure. know. Mm-hmm. Um, but the good thing is, is that I can do that, and it's okay. You get the freedom. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Definitely. to do that and to learn the history the the kind of fucked up history of Christianity and yeah. being and not have to tie myself in pretzels to um, to explain that away yeah and so it's um, and also be okay with it because I have no stake in it now yeah um, mm. so um, I just want to say thank you guys for doing this I've I listen to a lot of podcasts all of them are helpful but this one are I think just it's a cool because we're we're a smaller community, but we're growing. I know things will never always be the way they are at the beginning, but I'm really enjoying this process. And thank you so much for doing what you do, Joe. It's been a thank pleasure so to get much. to know you over the past six months as well, and we're really happy to have you as part of our community. Happy to have you on the show. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Hey Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. 
How's that? Patreon, it's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. <laughs> uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh... This is, as we said before, this is our our last episode of the season. Season finale, baby. Right, and we uh, we wanted to, so we reached out to our our who killed uh, Jr. Who shot Jr. Shot. I don't shot. Think he, excuse me. Yeah, it was all a dream. Who shot Mr. Burns? Uh, what is the smoke monster? Yep. Um. Uh. Who's gonna be president of the Battlestar Galactica? Uh, season finale of cliffhangers. John Snow is a. Oh, oh. We can't do we can't do Game of Thrones spoilers. Mm-mm. People freak out. People freak out. All right, we can um, do life after spoilers though. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Brady's <laughs> actually straight and Chuck is gay. <laughs> Chuck, Chuck's like, bum, bum, bum. hey, so Jehovah Witnesses have been coming to my house lately, and I've really been thinking about things. <laughs> You know, some of the literature that they presented is... I really think Jesus did die on a stake. I don't think it was a cross. Guys, I bought an e-meter and uh, <laughs> thinking about getting into religion. <laughs> will Plot <laughs> twists. Will Chuck return to evangelicalism? Find out after this break. <laughs> on, the, on the next M. Night Life After... <laughs> The Alan. Chuck, is that a is that a Max Lucado book? <laughs> Cut to commercial. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we should never be allowed to sit in front of microphones ever again. Not at all. But we'll, what we did do is we asked our our community and our listeners if you guys could give us some some feelings about this first season that we've had. It's been an experimental season. Yeah, it um, sure has considering that we had no idea what we were doing when we started. No, I just started to Google shit. We just like, hit record one day. How to make podcast. Right. Like I typed it out like a caveman. How to make podcast. <laughs> how to make podcast. Since then, I've learned more about articles and um, different parts of speech to make my sentences. How to make a podcast. <laughs> you know, a lot of improvement. You've gone, you've come so far this season, Brady. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to share... <laughs> We wanted to share those uh, some of those audio clips with you. Uh, we decided to respond to, to a couple of them. Some of them we think just uh, are totally self explanatory. They're beautiful in their own. We love yeah, you. Yeah, we don't. We don't need to. You don't need to hear our dumb voices afterwards. So, um, so we're gonna we're gonna uh, sprinkle those in. And, and uh, boy, have we got a show for you. Roll that beautiful boom, bean footage. Boom, 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 boom. If you. Hey, my name is Leighton Pustyovsky, and I'm from Dallas, Texas. The Life After podcast has been like therapy for me. When I deconverted, there was no announcement, no ribbon cutting, and no flag in the ground to say, this is where I am now. I felt like I just climbed a mountain and realized I'd been living in a valley my whole life. Listening to other people's stories on the podcast help me to deconstruct issues that I didn't even know how to describe to others. The first episode I listened to was about indoctrination, and it was a pivotal moment for me to realize that I was indoctrinated, not educated. My family is Christian, all of my close friends had jobs in Christian ministries, and I was in a Christian band. It was obviously a huge part of my identity, but I really didn't know how far the roots went down until I heard others talking about their own deconstruction and epiphanies they've had. I realized that being raised in the church caused me to have low self-esteem, an awful view of my own self-worth, and a terrible view of others. The church taught me a lot of warped views of relationships and sex, but I had no outside perspectives until I heard other people's stories on the life after each episode has been like a stepping stone away from religion one you are not a crazy person you are not alone two that doubting voice in the back of your head is logic and reason and it's okay to listen to it 
Three, purity culture does not work and it only makes relationships harder and it gives everyone a low sense of self-worth. Four, it's okay not to believe and if you grew up in the church, you've most likely been gaslighted in some form or fashion. I could go on and on about so many issues addressed in the podcast. There are plenty of dry podcasts that simply talk about religion and debate different religious beliefs, but what I love about The Life After is that it focuses on real, personal, and emotional stories. For people like me that have surrounded themselves with believers and then deconverted, I just wanted to know that there are other people like me out there. And I think many of us feel like we have no one to help us talk through this giant deconstruction of our lives. I've heard years of sermons and testimonies in the church, but after becoming an outsider, I needed to hear new testimonies of people that have also left the church. And I feel like that's what the life after is all about. Holy shit. Um, there's a theme that Leighton said that um, really stuck out with me. And Chuck, that was with having a low self-esteem and how much fundamentalism fucks with your self-worth and how you view yourself. Um, because, you know, we, we really, really believe that we were the scum of the earth and we're taught that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so it was really hard for me to walk away from that to try to figure out how to have a healthy self self image. And I remember I posted about that on Facebook a while back and somebody who's a Christian, they responded back like, well, your church said what? And then by that time, somebody who was from the same background was on there like uh, posting about how we shouldn't believe in ourselves. We shouldn't trust ourselves and all this different stuff. And I think that was the first time that my friend who, you know, is kind of, I think he's Lutheran, so he's a little bit more liberal than what I came up with, but it was the first time that I think he got a glimpse of how detrimental fundamentalism can be to your self-worth. Joey talked about having a, um, inferiority complex, and it's so, so, so true. Uh, but oh my God, everything Leighton said was so good, but I wanted to touch on that because that's something I've really dealt with a lot. Um, let's go ahead and play the next clip. I grew up in a non-denominational Pentecostal church. It was fairly large, about 1,500 people on a typical Sunday. Our pastor, I'll call him Brother D, was this old guy from Missouri, and he just loved the down-home boy country image that he had. He had this white suit he would wear that made him look just like Boss Hogg from the Dukes of Hazard. If you don't know what that looks like, Google Boss Hogg to get a mental picture. Anyway, whenever he made a misogynistic remark, we just shrugged it off as him just being a good old boy. The congregation loved and respected him in a way that almost bordered on worship. He really could do no wrong. And if he did do anything wrong, well, that didn't really matter because at least he preached the truth. The truth was everything to us. He was in his 70s when I was little, but he was still strong and energetic. When he was preaching, he would get all worked up, or the spirit would move him, or whatever, and he would jump up and down and dance on the stage. One day, during my senior year of high school, I came home and found my mom lying on her bed crying. When I asked what was wrong, she said some women in the church had accused Brother D of sexual assault. My first reaction was, no way, why would anyone say that about him? She got even more serious, looked me in the eyes, and told me the accusations seemed to be true. These were women we knew to be trustworthy, and there was apparently quite a bit of evidence. Not only that, but it had apparently been going on for years, longer than I had even been alive at that point. I was stunned. The next few days were surreal. Brother D skipped town for about a week and missed the Easter Sunday service. His daughter was the only other person who had keys to the church, and now that I look back on it, that's actually pretty strange for a church that size. But he was not one to share power with anyone. Anyway, his daughter refused to open the door without her father there, so the congregation had its Easter service that year on the front steps of the, in the street outside the church. A local news team showed up and filmed it. This happened in 1988, around the time Jim Baker and Jimmy Swagger were having their sexual scandals. The radio station I listened to ate the story up. I was mortified. When Brother D did return, he preached a sermon entitled, Touch Not God's Anointed. I thought I was going to throw up right there in the pew. This was the only church I'd ever known and the only pastor I'd ever known. 
And there he was, admitting to everything, but telling us we had no right to say anything because he was God's anointed. Of course, he didn't actually admit to sexual assault. He said the women had seduced him. Um, you still have that mental picture of Boss Hogg in your head? Right. I left that church along with the rest of my family, but a lot of people stayed. A lot of people. I never quite understood that. And although the situation was reported to the authorities, Brother D was never brought to justice. The chief of police at that time just happened to be a dedicated member of our church as well as a close friend of the pastor. So Brother D was deemed too old to prosecute. He lived another 18 years after that, and I'm sure he racked up more victims in that time. I can't imagine what his victims went through. I'm thankful to say I wasn't one of them, at least not directly. But his actions shook the lives of a couple thousand people. Our entire congregation, the women he had abused in the years past, families and friends. I asked my parents how he could have possibly covered his tracks so well that they had no idea what was going on all that time. They said, well, we'd heard stories over the years, but we ignored him. You know how people always like to talk bad about the preacher, and we felt it was our job to support him. A thought started to formulate in my mind that day, but I pushed it aside immediately. It started to come back many times in the years since 1988, but I've always pushed it back before I could really put words to it. Then, in an early episode of The Life After, Chuck Parsons said something that hit the nail on the head and took me right back to those days. I don't remember his exact words, but basically he said, there's no such thing as the Holy Spirit. If there were, the people who pray for guidance wouldn't go so far in the wrong direction. Like my parents. They prayed every day for the Spirit's guidance, but they didn't see this evidence until it slapped them in the face. I don't blame them too much. They're good people, and they were doing what they thought was right. But if there really was a Holy Spirit, wouldn't he have brought this abuse out into the open? We were Pentecostals, for crying out loud. We built our whole lives around following the Spirit. So, is there really a Holy Spirit at all? And if there isn't a Holy Spirit, is there a God? I still don't know what I think. Although I left that church, I remained evangelical until I was about 40. What led to my deconstruction is a whole other story, but now, a few years in, I'm feeling brave enough to finally take a deeper look at the past. Thanks, guys. Let's clear the pews. Holy shit. Um, thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Um, ew, Boss Hog. Yeah, uh, yeah, that image was, was rough. God, but it, you know, that is such a good example of um, when we've talked about like the hashtag church too, and we've had, you know, conversations about consent, which is to see how certain communities can perpetuate that sort of abuse and that sort of predatory behavior and to see how it kind of like get, it works out itself. Like they get away with it. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah, especially in the eighties and nineties. Uh, thankfully it's like starting, just starting slowly, slower in church culture than mainstream culture to, uh, become a, a issue that it actually gets addressed appropriately. But Big time. Yeah. Um, you know, cause at the time that we're recording this, you know, the Bill Hybels, is that his name? Right. Who, yeah. Bill Hybels, the uh, Willow Creek. Yeah. And the church, you know, whenever his, uh, victims came forward, the church, pushed them away, you know, and yeah. said that they were lying, yeah. but now like they're having to swallow their words and be like, Oh no, actually he is abusive and we were wrong. And we, well, it, and there's still their, their official statement still just said that he fell into sin, whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's they always still, lighten it. They we're always still, lighten Oh yeah, yeah. Totally. Just try to take the, the edge off of it. They didn't, they, in the official statement then that, that initially came out, they didn't even specify what the crime was was just kind of implied, you know? Right. So, well, we want to thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and I, I feel like next season, this would be a good topic for us to have like an entire episode. Yeah. On yeah. This. I think we, we want to tackle uh, hashtag church too. Um, again. And more yeah. like than we do with a consent episode. And right, really, right, right, right. Really Get a little bit more in detail in the specifically the ways that, um, that sexual abuse, sexual assault, rape, in those uh, topics are um, are protected in in church settings. And so many topics of church settings are protected. It feels like people just when you leave a church, you don't talk about it. And so I'm glad that like we're able to have these conversations, and it's also spinning off to these other conversations about sexual abuse. All of this, the right, 
things that people just don't talk about. And then whenever you start talking about it, you realize, oh yeah, I'm not the only one who's dealt with this shit, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, that, that seems to be a theme, uh, recently in, in just, I guess with the show in general is that people are saying like, oh, this happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I left the church and then I just didn't talk about it with anyone right. for forever. Cause there was either no one to talk to, or they didn't want to talk to, you know, they didn't want to talk about it or they, or they were being gaslighted. So they, couldn't talk about it or it wasn't worth it. So, um, yeah, it's really, it's really good that, um, I'm really, gl- I'm really glad that the show has become a platform for people to God, yeah. come forward about stuff like this. Absolutely. So it's terrible, terrible things that happen. Um, and, and we, uh, try to come together and we try to make space and empathize and validate and, uh, hopefully, Nip it in the bud. All right, let's uh, listen to the next uh, clip here. Hey guys, Will here. Um, I just wanted to say that it, for me personally, this whole journey of, um, as you would put it, just deconstructing my faith um, and just kind of coming out of that whole world that I've been in since before my birth, uh, it's been very long and awkward and uncomfortable, to say the least, and um, painful. Uh, more often than not. And I, um, man, I went through a few years of just feeling like complete shit because I don't know, you know, I didn't know, I didn't know what I was going through. didn't know anybody who was going through exactly what I was going through and, you know, found some friends who began to question things just like I did. But even with those friends, you know, we were alone. Nobody had the answers. Nobody had done it before. So, um, when a good friend of mine referred me to this podcast, and I listened to the first episode, I was blown away, uh, just to hear you guys' stories and, and know that there's not only somebody else out there who's gone through it and, and who's come out okay, uh, even though I know we're all still in process, but you're doing okay. You're, you know, I mean, you you guys are are not crazy and you're not broken down and you're not living in depression all the time. And that has given me so much hope. I can't even express how thankful I am for what you do and uh, just the fact that you guys are there trying to to be an inspiration and be an encouragement to other people going through the same thing. It means more than you could ever know. And I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Brady and Chuck, for doing what you do and being who you are and doing it right. (laughs) Getting out of the whole shit storm and doing it right. Uh, Anyway, that's all I wanted to say, but thank you so much. Really appreciate you guys. Last episode, we wanted to both uh, Chuck and I give our thoughts about the season, and um, I wanted to give mine. It feels weird. I feel like I'm writing in the yearbook on the last day of school to my baby. But if you listen to earlier episodes of this season, you'll know that we started. I started this epi- this podcast and everything because I wanted to find myself again. Leaving evangelicalism and leaving Christian fundamentalism left me completely lost. Um, If you go through and read the symptoms to religious trauma syndrome, I hit almost every single one of them. I I was so just scattered. But it was through his podcast I was able to find my voice again. Because after all of the things that happened to me at my church, I I felt like I couldn't talk about it. Nobody would believe me or I'd be gaslighted because that was my background with my family. I just felt like nobody would care. Nobody would hear or any of that. But through this podcast, I was able to find my voice. I set out to find myself. First thing I found, my voice. Second, I found my, I was more than just a soul for religion because it felt like before the most valuable thing that I could offer somebody or something is just my allegiance, my soul to this religion. Um, and that was my biggest worth is where am I going to spend eternity, blah, 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 blah. But then I realized, no, 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 no. What matters about me and what matters is now. And 
I discovered that I'm more than just my allegiance that I can give to a religion. I also rediscovered my creativity. That's what I found. Um, when I was a Christian, I was involved in writing skits each week uh, for my church. Then there was a time that I was in a uh, I was in a TV show. I wrote a novel. Creativity has always been a theme in my life, and I thought that it always had to do with Jesus and with God. Uh, but now that I've left fundamentalism and I've started this podcast, I've realized no, my creativity is just a part of who I am. My morality is just a part of who I am. My empathy and caring for others and wanting others to succeed and to sacrifice my time or whatever to make sure that that happens, that that's just a reflection of who I am. That wasn't a reflection of my religion. Um, so that's another thing that I found about myself while making this podcast. The biggest thing that I found out, though, is that I'm not the only one. I thought that I was the only person going through all of this shit. And uh, when I started to share my story, I realized I'm not. Uh, there's so many other people here. And I remember there was a shift of us making a podcast where I, I, it finally hit me of like, no, we need to have a community as well. Because the things that we've gone through and the things that we've left is enough for us to build an entire community and to have these bonds between each other that are important. And that's when we start to empathize with each other and start to share stories, share experiences, ask for advice, and uh, just share life together on the Facebook page and through emails and all of the different people that I've met through the podcast. I've realized I'm not the only one. We've started a community. I want to thank you guys so much for that, uh, for being part of this. And I have this one line that I want to read to you. And I mean this with all of my heart and I had to write it down because I don't want to get choked up. But this is to Chuck, um, to the listeners and, and everybody. And that is that I want to thank you. Thank you for hearing me when I thought that I was alone, when I thought I was the only one. Um, thank you for listening to me and allowing me to have a voice and for you to join your voice along with it and say, yeah, my experience was like that. There was a time in Jamie's episode where she talked about when we go through trauma, we talk to others. There's a point where we say me too. Thank you to all of you who have listened, who have joined our community. And as we start next season, um, please come with us. And I want us to grow together. Thank you for listening. We only have a handful of truly formative experiences in our lifetime. A few years ago when I was first leaving my faith, when I first made the decision sitting on my back porch beneath the sugar maple, I would think about my evangelical upbringing and get so angry. I would argue in my mind, argue away the negligence and abuse, argue away my depravity. Pages of journals and notebooks were filled up with these intense emotions. So much was taken from me, and so much of the human experience was glazed over. I was exhausted from the fight of leaving, still spinning from the blows. And this is part of it. We're all angry at some point. We're all trying to make sense of our experiences, restoring our own sense of dignity piece by piece. I'm not angry anymore, not because I don't have a reason to be, but at some point life just calls you into something bigger than anger. Anger is deconstructive. It's about swinging fists and words that cut. It's about stripping a person or a thing of its legitimacy, making it small and irrelevant. We all have to do that with the lies we've been told. We all have to make the God that controlled us for so long small enough to step on or climb over or whatever it takes to make that first step forward. But at some point, and that point is different for all of us, I think we all have to put down the sledgehammer of anger, pick up a pencil and start drawing some blueprints. Get some supplies together, start building or sculpting or painting or whatever your metaphor is. For me, one thing that was really hard about leaving religion something I had a really hard time putting into words for a long time, was that I was giving up the biggest thing that had formed me into who I am. It was like ripping the skeleton out of a vertebrate. What do you build off of? What gives you structure and shape? 
It's scary to leave one skeleton when you don't know where or how to find another one. It's scary not to have a space or philosophy to build off of. I felt lost, structureless, and I felt that way for a long time, more sure of what I didn't believe than what I did. We only have a handful of truly formative experiences in this lifetime, and for me, getting behind this microphone, putting on some headphones, sitting across from Brady, and listening to the volumes of stories that have become the life after is truly one of those experiences. This time with the freedom to think for ourselves, or feel what we feel, or want what we want, and need what we need. For so long I was afraid I had left behind the most meaningful experience and community I would ever be a part of. But all of you listeners, guests, Brady, all of you who have written us or participated in the private group have shown me that there is a much larger and more important task at hand than religion could ever offer me. The chance to be free and help others be free, grow, discover themselves for the first time, push themselves, heal old wounds, embrace our own voice own their power, find their own light. We're all sifting through the rubble of deconstruction, but it's a new kind of life and energy you find when you realize that you're free to build whatever you want. That is truly formative, and each and every one of you have given me that in some way, and for that I am deeply, deeply grateful. Thank you, all of you, for listening. Thank you for speaking your mind. Thank you for sharing your fears, your trauma, your wounds, your triumphs, your growth, your healing, because all of those beautifully human emotions and words and vulnerabilities are helping me draw new plans and build new and more beautiful experiences. And I know I'm not the only one. Thank you. I'm Chuck Parson, and we'll see you next season. I don't remember which episode it was, but the topic came up of where to find community out there after you've lost your religious community. This is one of the hardest things about leaving faith and a search I've been on for several years now. It seems obvious, but one of you said, you have to go out and start it yourself. This inspired me to do exactly that. And my local leaving religion community has grown faster than I could have imagined and started to blossom into something really special. I'm so excited for its growth and the challenges of helping guide others and be guided by others through the biggest transition of our lives. So thank you guys for letting me be a part of the community you started and inspiring me to do the same. Um, so the life after normalized my experience for me. And I really can't put into words what this has meant, but I'm going to try my best. Um, I've definitely been dealing with shame I used to think that my getting involved with an abusive church was a character flaw and my staying in the church for over four years when all of my instincts were telling me to run was something that I should be embarrassed of. Uh, but the reality is so much more complicated than that and I'm not alone in it and this podcast has really, yeah, helped that hit home for me. Um, you guys and the other survivors that you've had on your show aren't losers. Um, and that may sound like a weird thing to say, but I felt like my experience was an indication that I was somehow a loser for letting this happen. Um, but you guys are all intelligent, well-spoken individuals who are secure in your identities. And like me, you've also been victims of spiritual abuse. Um, so I no longer feel ashamed of my story. It doesn't make me a loser. I also don't feel like a victim anymore. Um, I'm a strong and I'm a good person. I do have a very wild story about religion and spirit, spiritual abuse, but that story isn't me. Um, so thanks for the life after. And I finally made a Patreon account to support your work. It definitely is much cheaper than tithing. And thanks for reminding me every week or every time you record of what's really important, that if you don't go to church, Sunday is just another Saturday. All right, thanks. My story is more common than it should be. I am one of many victims of abuse by a quote unquote, man of God. Also common, my church leaders chose to believe my abuser, and then they brushed the things that happened to me under the carpet. 
I was 19, suffering with PTSD from the trauma of the abuse, and I was abandoned by my church, my home. I didn't know I was alone at first, of course. I thought I still had God, but that deafening silence broke me. That was 16 years ago. For 16 years, I thought I was alone, but a few months ago, I found this podcast. I cannot express how life-giving finding this community has been. Hearing the stories of other survivors of religious abuse has given me the words to tell my own story, and I am. I'm finding my voice, I am telling my truth, and I am healing. I was thrust into a world about which I had been taught so many untruths. Episodes of this podcast have been able to vividly paint the picture of that desolation, and going through it alone was agony that I almost didn't survive. I'm thankful that this resource exists. I believe lives will be saved because others going through the tortures of deconstructing toxic indoctrinations won't be isolated. I wish this had been around 16 years ago. I could have found out sooner that the best life is the life after. We do get those second Saturdays after all. Thanks guys for all that you do and thank you to all the brave voices speaking out. Guys, I've been binging the life after, freaking loving it. I'm actually a coach, I'm a career coach for millennials and um, used to be a missionary, was married, got out of that crazy shit. I know you guys understand that. And uh, I just gotta say, what you're doing is so important, so important that people have a place to go, me, that I have a place to go and hear other people's stories so I don't feel alone. So thank you for spending your time and energy. I'll be a supporter here. Um, I'm gonna go on your Patreon right after this, but I just want you to know, I think you're doing a really important thing. Please don't stop. Let us know how we can support you in that. I tend to help people out of their church positions, out of toxic church positions. Uh, I help them quietly behind the scenes. They hire me to help them find a different career. And um, I see not only for myself, but certainly in my clients, the need to have a community where they can go and uh, they can actually talk about what is healthy and relationally normative and good for you. So thanks so much, you guys. I'm cheering you on, uh, not just with my words, but um, with backing as well. Keep going. I'm here for you. Hey, Chuck and Brady. This is uh, this is Ben Emerson. Um, I've been a frequent commenter, poster on the Facebook site, and I've been listening to your podcast since earlier um, this year. I just want to say that you know I I started uh, deconstructing probably about three years ago, and it really wasn't until I found your podcast that I I felt like. You know, I felt like there were people out there who who understood what I was going through, and listening to you guys felt like I was like, oh, these are the conversations I so wish I could have with people, and so maybe a little bit like vicariously, I was able to <laughs> have those through listening. Um, but it's been it's been so great because I listen to you guys and I feel like, oh man, like we could be friends. Uh, if I lived in St. Louis, I would totally want to hang out with you because I think we'd have a good time. You guys seem cool. But thank you so much for uh, for making space for people of, of so many different walks of life uh, who've been through the craziness that is, uh, you know, evangelicalism or even other, other forms of religion and, and giving us a space to, to detox and to talk about it and process how we're doing. Um, I, I, I'm just really grateful. Um, and not only that, but the quality of your podcast is excellent. Um, (laughs) just, you, you guys are great interviewers and you are great hosts. So I, I'm just really appreciative of all the work that you've put into building this community and making this podcast. And, uh, I'm really looking forward to what's next and, uh, want to know if there's any ways I can be of help, uh, because it's a great thing you guys are doing and a great thing for, for people, you know, like all of us to, to have access to. So thanks a lot. Congrats on wrapping up season one. I can't wait for season two. All right. Bye-bye.